Welcome to our Wednesday evening conversation on March the 3rd. We're actually recording on Tuesday afternoon, March the 2nd. Uh, this is a little bit earlier for us than we've been recording the last uh, month or so. So any prayer concerns that arise new uh, Tuesday afternoon and evening and Wednesday, we will obviously miss those. But we do have uh, many prayer concerns to share with you tonight before we begin our study. Uh, many of our church family have lost loved ones in the last few days and we want to pray for them. Uh, Barbara Riddle's sister died and her service was on Monday. We want to continue to pray for Barbara and for their family. Uh, Christy Bird and Richard Finley both lost their mothers this week. We want to pray for Christy and her family and Richard and, um, and his family as they mourn and as they grieve. Lisa Elliott's sister died and we want to pray for Lisa and her family uh, during this time. Also, let's remember uh, several uh, FAB members who uh, either are in the hospital or have been in the hospital. Bill Sturm had surgery last week, was in the hospital a couple of days. Uh, he was home over the weekend and is doing well, but we want to continue to remember Bill. And Bill Myers uh, is actually having surgery today. This is Tuesday, remember, he's having surgery today. So we don't have a report for him right now, but we want to continue to pray for Bill as he has a hip replacement surgery. And then also received word today that uh, a former member of our church who, who grew up at FAB, uh, Joseph Duffy, uh, died. Uh, he went on from FAB uh, to school at Yale and then served as a college president in Massachusetts and eventually was uh, in charge of the whole UMass system and was for a couple years the president at American University. So uh, someone that uh, uh, if you've been at FAB for a long time, you, you might remember and we want to pray for his family uh, during this time. Vaughn, would you lead us in our prayer? Absolutely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Bless our Heavenly Father, we just pause, Lord, and we just ask that you continue to watch over us, that you continue to guide us. Lord, we lift up those families who have lost a loved one, Lord. Uh, it's never easy, Lord, and we ask that you comfort them, that you provide care for them, that as they go through the grieving process, that you would uh, be a light into their feet and a lamp into their path, Lord. Guide them. And Lord, guide our conversation today. Watch those who are viewing this, Lord, uh, make yourself evident to them. And bless this conversation. May it be pleasing unto you, Lord. May we continue to be in your will. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So tonight we'll talk about the characteristics of church strategy, essential strategy of churches that are growing together and growing young. That's called Prioritize Young People and Families Everywhere. So uh, we're going to dive into this one. This one I think is going might be just a little bit different. Uh, you never know with Vaughn and I, we probably could talk for hours on any subject. Just name a subject, we'll just start talking. But we do have a sense in preparing for this one that this might be a little bit of a shorter session than we've experienced, but that will be okay if that turns out to be the, the case. All right, Vaughn, when the authors talk about prioritizing young people and families everywhere, uh, what does that mean to you? When you hear them or when you, as you've read this chapter, what sticks out to you? What does it mean to you to prioritize young people and their families? Yeah, so when you initially read this, uh, the chapter heading in this particular section, you automatically think that, um, well, the whole book is about prioritizing young people and families everywhere. So what is, why, what do we need to go a little bit more in depth in, in that? And what this chapter is really doing is kind of segueing in the circle. If you're looking at page 199, there's a the diagram of, of the core commitments. Um, last week, as we talked about developing a, a warm relationship and how we can be a warm community as a church to young people and families, um, as we transition into that, uh, to prioritize young people and young families uh, everywhere is really an intentional effort to start action. Um, and so this is now where the rubber meets the road. This is giving you the next steps um, to do uh, this growing young process. So as you notice in that same diagram, there's a uh, kind of turning off point 
after the the warm uh, relationships that um, that Alicia and Eric talked about last week was a great job, um, beautiful, beautiful job there. Um, but if we continue to develop our own little warm circles um, and we stop there, then the church will grow old. Now, there's nothing wrong with growing old because each uh, each church has its season. But in our uh, strategizing here in this book, um, we see that uh, prioritizing young people everywhere is an intentional step, an action step. So what steps can we take to make that happen? And this chapter really characterizes um, what does that, that look like and, and what does that mean for, for us and as we continue to have these conversations and as we continue to have conversations uh, with our congregations on Sunday nights and, and doing this, we will um, flesh that out. So. Uh is it fair to say, uh, and, and, and you've, you've thought a little bit deeper on this than I have, is it fair to say that in interpreting this diagram that uh, when you get into that circle of the warmth and the uh, empathy that it's easy to um, be closed? It, I mean, it, it is the image about a closed circle where it's harder for new people to come in? Right. Is that, right. Yeah. So it's 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 simpler to to uh, think that a subject is important. It's simpler to empathize with that subject. Right. And the point is, if it stops there, then it dies. All right. So you can only think that something is important for so long, and then it's not important. Or you can empathize until you feel like, well, I've empathized with this group of people right. for so long it's no longer important um, this is the next step of saying hey we're going to continue to feed into this will we're going to continue to feed and look for uh, new people how do we uh, not only uh, integrate young people and young families into the system how do we then go back to being empath empathetic with them how do we uh, teach yeah. and, and stay true to Jesus's message how do we develop warm relationships to go back again to say well what new things and new people we can bring into the system them by being our best neighbors and to give them keychain leadership and the cycle keeps going on. I think somewhere in, I think it was in this chapter that they, the authors, they didn't identify the person who made the quotation. I think it was Peter Drucker, but it's a quotation that I have read that's been quoted in just about every business leadership book and every church leadership book that I have read recently. And the, it goes something like this, that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast um, and I wonder if that's a part of what's going on with this circle that right. if you I mean it you know you, strategy is important right but but I think what they're talking about here is intentionally developing mm -hmm. um, allowing the spirit in participating with the Holy Spirit in the development of a culture that prioritizes young people so it's not just like uh, it, it Meaning culture, it just becomes a part of who you are. It's right. a part of your DNA. And right. if you don't, if it, I like what you said. If it's just something that you're intentional about for a while, it's hard to sustain that unless the culture itself becomes a culture that prioritizes young people. Absolutely. Families. So if you look again back at that at that will on 199, um, you see that it's all surrounded in context. So the context is the culture in which envelops that those six strategies, right? Yeah. So the context is always going to shift mm. as you continue to add and prioritize, which is a reason why you know that is a, such a turning point of where are we going to grow old and stay with our old context and just yeah. allow this to be our intentional efforts right now or the important effort right now. Or are we going to continue to uh, envelop and, and, and increase our presence and, and warm community and keychain leadership to right. the next generation and to the next generation, which changes, which changes our context every yeah. single time. Um, and we, I wanted to say this, and I can't remember if we said we'd say this at the end or if we'd say this at the beginning, so forgive me if I messed Either this up. Or. All right. So um, we, uh, one of the one of the challenges, so, so we've had a great, I think we've had great energy and great uh, movement as we've talked about the book on Wednesday nights, as Alicia's talked about the book on Wednesday nights. Uh, as many people have read, we had a small group uh, meeting a couple weeks ago that that went really well. Mm -hmm. And then we've got eight or nine folks that have, starting in October, 
uh, have had two gatherings from Saturday mornings from 8 to 1 or 2 and we'll have two more. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of momentum in dealing with the content of this book. The challenge becomes, okay, well how do you begin to implement it? And uh, don't, don't worry, this, the implementation will not be like radical changes, but right. what we want to do is come up with some smaller experiments uh, using some of these uh, uh, strategies and, and see where God leads us. So um, we're not really at a place where we can say, here are some, here are some small experiments that mm -hmm. we can do. Uh, and it seems to me that in terms of this chapter, it's those small experiments that really connect with the theme of prioritizing young people. So, so there'll be other, there'll, there'll be some things that emerge uh, that we can, and the, I liked how you explained the beauty of small experiments. What are the beauty of small experiments? So the beauty of small experiments is, is, um, is not taking a lot of investment, but can have a huge impact. So it doesn't cost us a lot to do these small things that says, uh, hey, well, let's experiment around this. And if it takes off, it takes off. But if it fail, we're not losing the entire uh, idea or the entire system on this. So it's not a hinge point experiment. These are small experiments that, that will help us um, grow. Um, and if it doesn't, then there's no, like, there's no love loss. Um, we just, you know, Go on to the next it's a learning one. experience. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning experience. Uh, prioritize young families, uh, not just young people. Say more about that, Vaughn. Your thoughts when they say uh, not just the young people, but the young families. Right. So uh, the question that was brought up into, and it's one of the myths in this in this chapter, is um, is good intentions enough? Is good intentions enough? And I think in the early. Uh, 2000s, late uh, 90s, early 2000s, there was a sh church shift to young families, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Most most churches saw, you know, we want to reach out to young families, let's prioritize young families, which is great. But I think this chapter is really, uh, you know, diving into the idea that we need to continue to do more. Um, and, and when we prioritize young families, uh, what happens when those young families of the 90s are now empty nesters in the in, in 2020 right, right? so uh, how 2021. do 2021 2021 mm -hmm. um, so we are now walking with how do we prioritize still prioritize those families and this chapter is saying that parents are important when we're talking about yeah. young people right so now that you're transitioning into uh, what is commonly known as the empty nesters how does the church walk with and prioritize your needs as well and the truth is what has happened um, whenever your priorities change as a young parent, as I, I'm a young parent, my priorities, my interest, um, follows my daughter's interest and my son's interest, right? So as she's growing up and is learning how to dance, if she wants to take dance classes, guess where daddy's gonna be? Daddy's gonna prioritize dance classes. Um, but daddy's not gonna go to dance classes by daddy's self if my daughter is not in there, right? So when, when Iris uh, grows up, um, when she graduates, when she moves out of her house, um, when she's no longer there, that is not going to be a priority of, of mine. And the, and the thing that we've seen in church is that church has become one of those categories in which students prioritize and parents then prioritize because they want a relationship with their student. But what happens is when the student stops prioritizing church or no longer goes to church, there's no connection for the parent to then prioritize. There's a bunch of psychological shifts yeah. in becoming an empty nester that we can talk about later, but um, it's, it's really talking about on the church's efforts of really um, trying to be intentional in action steps yeah. on reaching uh, families, because it's, it's extremely important. And I think that's one of the byproducts of doing this study, uh, and there are many, but, but one of them is, okay, you know, we probably haven't as a church been as intentional in walking with uh, families, uh, empty nesters, you know, folks whose, whose children are now young adults and they no, no longer live at home. And so that's one of the things we want to do. We want to experiment with that. Mm -hmm. how, how can we be more supportive of uh, parents in that transition, uh, that life stage? Now, uh, one thing that this book says, and every book I've ever read, I think, has, has said about this, and we all know it intuitively, but it's good to have it reaffirmed, and that is 
the the students, the young people who um, grow in their faith, who mature in their faith, who stick with it, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, even as they go off to, to college or the workforce and become young adults, um, tend to be higher percentage of those young people have the faith modeled for them at right. home. Uh, you know that the that there is just no uh, replacement for the value of families living the life of Jesus for each other for their children to right. develop which is not to put, that's a lot of pressure not to put pressure <laughs> on, on parents it is it is to say it is to speak to the importance of the family and it is to say that um, even though we as a church have a huge role in the life of young people coming to faith um, that role of the family is 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 absolutely crucial and so part of what we want to do coming out of this study is build on what we've already done and what we've been doing for years, uh, and that is supporting families uh, in, in their faith, um, you know, all throughout the, the cycle, I guess, of, of, of growing up from, from birth to young adulthood. Right. We want to support families as they, as, they love, as they love their kids. So it's really about the church walking with alongside the parents on this journey. Yeah. And and again, uh, this this specific topic is so important that the same people who put out Growing Young yeah. uh, wrote a, a book on it, and it's called Growing right. With. Yeah. Um, and, and that is going to be a study that we're going to, to look at after we finish this study and as we grow. How do we partner with the parents um, as they are psychologically and spiritually going through this journey? Um, what are the ups and downs and the twists and the turns um, with that? And how can the church partner with parents to do that. So um, I will always put pressure on parents to be that uh, the kind of steeple for their, for their children um, and the foundation of faith. Um, and, and sometimes we can control that, sometimes we can't, they just put the pressure right. on, on the parents. But what we can't control is how the church, as we as the body or um, the ecclesia, the assembly, uh, the church, how can we as the church uh, exhibit um, the love, compassion, grace, right. Um, here to prioritize young people um, and and so there's this uh, progression you know first we, we find the importance of it the importance of prioritizing young people and we know that is important if it wasn't important we wouldn't be reading this book right mm -hmm. so we know that that's important right and then we become we take intentional um, efforts to do it so we're reading this book we're doing this as as, as a study for us yeah. as, as a whole church study um, that's that's intentional efforts and then this is talking about action yeah and it's talking about putting um, you know again using that term where the rubber meets the road how do we intentionally do that in a way that our young people feel special not because of what they do or what they can offer us, but they feel special in the sense right. of being special in the eyes of the Lord. How can we exhibit being the body and saying your gifts are important as well? So it's almost as if to the extent that we can communicate that to young people, young adults, how special they are to us as a church, it reinforces, hopefully, you know, it reinforces what they're learning at home. Right. Even to the extent, it's, it's not like parents have to be uh, superstar Christian uh, uh, mentor, you know, to their to their children. Right. It's more, you know, we want young people to find those close adult connections with people here too. Right. It, it, it's more that, um, and, and oftentimes, uh, it's the it's the adult at church who our children will listen to more than they'll listen to their parents. You haven't discovered that yet. No, one day no, you will. one day. One day. Um, which doesn't take away the importance of uh, what parents do. Right. Uh, in fact, I think it, it's almost it's almost like parents living out their faith is kind of like this foundation, this this backbone. And sometimes that means that uh, students, young adults, children have deep spiritual conversations with their parents, but not always. Maybe those deep spiritual conversations happen at church, but but there is this foundation of faith that the young person has uh, at home. At least that's what we hope. Absolutely. And when that doesn't happen, that doesn't mean, if a young person doesn't have a strong uh, faith foundation at home, that doesn't mean that the young person can't have that, that, that God can't work 
through the church to do it. Right. And and that's one of our great privileges as a church to come alongside young people and young adults who may not be receiving, who may, whose parents may not come to church, for example, mm-hmm. whose parents may not be following Jesus closely. And we get to then uh, help them to see Jesus and to follow him. Um, it's more kind of this ideal sense that, that we want to see, we want to support families and we want to support young people in their faith. So how do we do that? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. No. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, the, it's the whole ministry of the church. That's why we talk about this as growing together. Right. That, that we are wanting to minister to people of every age group and it takes us all. All of us working together. All of us, I, I think we talk about this a lot because I think it's so important, that giving attention to one's personal spiritual growth is not a selfish thing. Right. It can be. You can become self-absorbed in intending to your own spiritual growth where you think it's all about you. But I think the goal for us is to give a lot of attention to our own walking with Jesus and our own spiritual growth so that we can minister to others. In other words, we can't minister to our children, we can't minister to our neighbors if, if we're not paying attention to who Jesus is shaping us to be. And so if we can encourage everybody to do that, if, if, if mom and dad are growing in their faith, then they're going to be better parents. Right. Uh, if any of us are growing in our faith, then we're going to be better whatever. We're going to be better at our jobs, we're going to be better neighbors, better caregivers, better church members, et cetera, all that. So I think um, personal, spiritual, we have to take responsibility for our own personal growth. Uh, and when we do that, everybody wins. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a benefit for everybody. Absolutely. So did I just answer your question? Yeah, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> Let me shift to the page 208 and this was the uh, this was something in this chapter that really connected with me and the chapter the the section heading the bottom of 208 says young people must play a load bearing role. And and the idea is uh, you know you have in a house or a building, you have certain walls that are there for show, they're more aesthetic, uh, and then you have other walls that bear the load of the, of the structure. And um, I think for us to look for more activities, I'm not sure what the right word is, more areas in the life of our church where students and young adults are actually doing load-bearing work for us, I think that could be huge. I, I think that could be transformative for our congregation, where it's not just we're giving young people the chance to do something that's mm. nice, but not like essential to the function of the church. There's value in that, but, but we've really upped our game when we ask our young people and help our young people lead them to do load-bearing kind of work. And we're actually doing that right now uh, in that we are, we, we're adding this contemporary music element to our worship service coming out of the worship, coming out of the vision process a couple years ago. And our young people are, 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 are load-bearing in that. Uh, Alexandra sang mm-hmm. uh, this past Sunday, uh, Laura, Gatewood, uh, Truitt's played the piano, Luke plays the guitar consistently, Jensen, uh, who else? Who am I missing? We've had lots of different lots, yeah. we've had lots of different young people that have led that uh, that music and and it's a, it's a load they've been it's a load bearing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course doing uh, lots of different not just youth but children who are reading scripture and praying as a part of our worship service. Um, Let's not forget that, that Neely and Ryan. Neely, both, they're, they're young adults. Yes, thank and you. Young thank adult. you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John also fits in. in, in you fit realm. too. So I also you, fit yeah, in. Yeah. yeah. So we've got. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that that's already happening, and I, I think I think that's huge. Now the book talks about doing away with Youth Sunday. Uh, I don't think Vaughn and I talked about this. 
I don't think that I don't think we want to do away with Youth Sunday, but talk about that. What yeah, so so yeah, the, so the book found that, um, and and it's really looking at the heart of what it was trying to say, not necessarily get rid of the Youth Sunday, but the reason why yeah. um, churches do Youth Sundays, and historically, and I'm not saying that we have done this because we have definitely shifted the way that we've looked at Youth Sundays. Um, but historically, churches looked at Youth Sunday just to be entertained by youth. Let's give the youth just something to do um, and, and, just, and say, oh, look, little Johnny, sorry if your kid's name is Johnny, little Johnny is, is up there singing or little Johnny is up there giving the message and we're not giving right. much, um, you know, buy into it. We just, you know, we're not listening right. to the message. We just love the fact that our kid is up there to entertain our purposes. And I think for us, and this is the reason why I think that uh, they say do away with it because it's doing away with the mentality that the kids are here to just entertain. We're here to just give them um, something to do or they're here to kind of please us. And, and I think that for Fab, uh, and, and this, definitely the approach that I've been taking for um, youth ministry is understanding why we are doing the things that we're doing. And if it doesn't serve a purpose in which gives kids a key uh, keychain leadership or showing them that they're the priority or giving them load-bearing um, opportunities, then we don't do them. Right. Um, so, so for Youth Sunday, um, we've taken the shift from um, being entertained to really listening in to the tech. So, um, and this church has done a fantastic job is that um, our seniors give their testimonies um, on, on Senior Sunday. On, on Youth Sunday. So you're hearing how God has worked in their lives. And hopefully that inspires you to see how God is currently working in your life. Because that's that, that that work doesn't stop once you're once you're baptized, right? So God is continuing to work in your life every day. So by giving the testimonies, we're saying, hey, you're a part of the family, uh, youth age student, but also to the to the to the congregant who's 80 years old you're also a part of the body and you have a story and you have a story and we need to share these stories together and, and that's how you really reach to prioritize so i will never get rid of a youth sunday but i will challenge people's never, perspective never say never 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 say never well it, you know who knows where god will lead us but yeah <laughs> yeah but we're so so it's so i think where we in the pandemic has helped make this happen right. uh, a, a positive byproduct of a horrible thing We've we've shift, we've moved beyond just Youth Sunday, right? So so now so Youth Sunday, you know, it, it's the youth play a load bearing role one Sunday a year. Right. Now we're seeing youth in worship do load bearing work uh, almost every Sunday. Every and, Sunday, yeah. And, and then and I really appreciate you bringing out. And I want to point emphasize this. So in both traditional music aspects mm -hmm. of our church and contemporary aspects of it our young people are doing load-bearing work. So Neely is a Marshall student, yep. a Marshall music student, and then Ryan's in grad school. Ryan is a part of the church prior to school. Neely came to us as a Marshall student. And and they're, along with, with Janet and, and, and John and, and others, they're the backbone of that uh, more traditional part of our music. And then our, our students, our young people, um, teenagers, are, are that backbone for the contemporary element. Right. So I, I think I think that's a beautiful thing. So we will look for, one of the things coming out of this book, I think, is we want to look for more opportunities for our youth and young adults to do load-bearing work for our church. Uh, now, one final thing. Um, you, uh, you and I talked, Vaughn, about uh, 217. And I think you've already, you've actually already addressed this, but anything more you want to say on that importance, intentionality, leading to action? Anything right, so, about so, so 217, it, it, you have the less than sign, right? So, yeah. so um, importance is less than intentionality, that's less than action. And here you see like, well, it's good to have importance, it's good to, you know, say this is important to us, but that will all ultimately falter or fade. Um, Intentionality, yeah, we can be an intentional for, for a season. And you see churches are intentional about something for a season, and then that fades. It's only when you are actually putting action behind your words that it becomes the culture or the DNA of the church, right? So, um, you know, 
the words speak, actions speak louder, right? So now we're talking about, well, what actions can the church do? Uh, and, and hopefully through this process, we're allowing the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we don't want to be, we don't want to get into a position where we're telling God what to do. We want God to, to tell us and guide us yeah. according to his will. And that's where the action will come out. So at the end of this book, I'm just going to give you a preview of the end. Don't expect for us to have a seven-step plan, action plan for us to change. It's not going to happen. But what we will do, and hopefully through prayer and, and, and through um, this conversation, is that we are going to allow the Spirit to lead us to what we feel is best for, for what is it within God's will. And I think that is important for us yeah. to put action towards that and allow God to move yeah. us instead of we telling God, well, we want to move and God, you bless our move. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a different perspective. It's good to have all three. It's good to you know show importance. It's good to be intentional. But it's best when you couple all three of those um, together. And I think that's where those experiments come in mm -hmm. to talk about. That again, and I really like the way you describe that, that um, an experiment gives us a chance to to try something new um, in a way that it could go great and have you know a huge impact, or it might fail. But if, if it's in that smaller way, uh, it, it's okay. We right. we we we've, we've learned either way, and so I think uh, we want to be looking for those kinds of, of actions. Right. I would also add it's it's uh, it's. Yes, the the we call we're calling them experiments. So the small ex experiments are important, but I think the biggest thing again, going back to this 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 importance, intentionality, of an action being the main part, is the journey by which we are on these experiments. So being able to walk with young people, and if something goes great sit down and say well why did this work and it's yeah. the journey let's 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 build a warm community talking about this journey yeah. to this or if it failed well let's let's get together and talk yeah. about it and then let's let's really grow as we're growing um together uh, we're really evaluating ourselves so it's really about our church being uh, flexible um, and being open to have genuine conversations. Yeah. Um, we, we use these bu buzzwords, you know, uh, genuine and authentic, um, and we say, you know, these are just buzzwords that young people want to use, but there's some truth behind having a genuine conversation with a young person in the sense of allowing them to talk, uh, for you to listen, not to re respond, but to listen, right. to actually listen. Tell me more. Um, just tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. So it's interesting how all these are now building on each other. And as you continue to go into the cycle, you're going to go through that cycle again and yeah. again. And if you're doing it right, if you're doing it right, you will go through the cycle. And it's never ending. And that's the, just the church growth cycle. That's how we grow. And that's what life with Jesus together is, uh, is, is all about. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your attentiveness tonight on this fifth of the six essential strategies. Next week, we will cover uh, the last of the strategies, be the best neighbors, loving and shaping your world well. And then two weeks from now, we'll have a wrap up of our Wednesday evening mm -hmm. conversations as we, as we discuss the conclusion of the book. Um, thanks for being with us. Let's conclude in prayer. Would you pray with us? Oh Lord, we're grateful for the challenge, the invitation to prioritize young people and families everywhere in the life of our church. We pray that you would guide us as we do so. Lead us to those load-bearing activities, uh, acts of service that young adults and students can do in the life of our church. Help us as we minister to families at the various different stages in the life of a family. And be with us as we experiment and learn and uh, seek new ways to, to love and serve you and to prioritize our ministry with young people. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being with us. See you later.